You are listening to Eastman's Flycast, an adventure fly fishing specific podcast covering travel, tactics, and next level insight. Now your host, Brian Barney. Hey, what's going on, guys? Got a brand new Eastman's Flycast for you. Uh, so I thought I'd sit down this morning and um, record a solo podcast as I've been fishing a bunch here lately and just share some insight into wintertime fishing some insight into streamer fishing and also nymphing. So we'll get right into it. I just want to thank one of my sponsors. I want to thank Avid Max. Avid Max, they have an online retail store as well as an in-person store just outside of Denver. Uh, they've got a super knowledgeable staff in absolutely everything for fly fishing. Uh, they have flies, rods, reels, uh, all the different hottest lines, um, they just have a great selection. They've got a really good clearance rack with a bunch of items on sale, camping gear, uh, dog toys, you name it, they have it. Uh, great place. We really appreciate their support over here on Flycast. So if you're in the market for anything fly fishing, make sure to check out avidmax.com. I uh, also want to thank Eastman's for support of this podcast. Uh, they're primarily a hunting-based uh, company and and to, to think outside the box and support a fly fishing podcast uh, really means a lot to me so thanks to those guys and everything they do uh, on the hunting side of things we just had a, a new bow hunting video come out I, I think it's called a, a bow hunting open country bucks um, just an awesome video I'm really proud at uh, proud of that uh, recorded this season on an early season hunt with my good buddy Dan some good laughs in it and um, some really good mule deer action and uh, really really proud at how those editors put that together and and was were able to compile all that information so you can check out that video just search on YouTube Eastman's Hunting TV and you can find it there and with that, wintertime fishing, man, it's been hot lately. It's been so fun. Um, I, I really meant to be out more in the fall, and uh, I was so busy with my hunting season and, and traveling to different places and, and putting together these hunts that I didn't get many days in. And um, so as my hunting season started to wind down, I uh, really got to the, to the river with renewed vigor. Uh, it's been a while since I'd been fishing hard. And so, yeah, I've made a bunch of different trips. And whether that's wade fishing or floats and uh, been out with my buddy Charlie, uh, been out with my dad, which has been really fun. And so I just wanted to sit down and talk over some wintertime fishing strategies that might help you guys out. Um, so here in, in Ennis, Montana it gets cold. It gets bitter cold. So, um, my rule of thumb, you know, I can fish as it gets into these colder temps and every once in a while I'll go swing a big hole when it's really cold, 15, 20 degrees, something like that. But usually my rule is, is I above freezing. Um, you know, and, and you'll still get your eyelets will freeze up and, and it'll still be cold. But for me, like above freezing is pretty enjoyable temps to get out and get after these fish. And the nice thing is, is there is nobody on the river. Uh, I absolutely have it all to myself. And I mean, you know, like the Madison is a blue ribbon trout stream. So many guys fishing it, you know, in the peak season, in the summer months and things. But in these winter months, uh, these fish are hungry. Uh, nobody's on the river. And, and it just surprises me like how many of these older age class fish are in this river that during pressure, they just start feeding nocturnally or they start uh, uh, feeding at select window times. And so, you know, you, you, you catch these fish in the summertime, but man, it sure seems like you, you catch them more frequently in the off season months. Like right now, they are just looking for food. Um, so I've been hitting it hard in the wintertime. You know, it seems like these fish... Um, they tend to kind of group up and hold in these bigger, deeper wintertime holes. Uh, I almost think of it like steelheading. And so uh, knowledge of the river is huge. Like, if, like, like me, knowing this Madison inside and out, like I know where the big holes are. I know where it slows down. So I can kind of come up with a... a uh, come up with these ideas or come up with these holes that I know will be holding wintertime fish. And so they really like to hold to the tail out instead of the head of the runs. Uh, so they like to be in 
Um, you know, and the Madison is is a fairly shallow river, but they still, they like to find these deep wintertime holes, these holes that are two to five feet deep, and they like to hold in the slower slack water. So they like to hold, you know, probably walking pace water or even, you know, on the edge in these seams, but I uh, really focus on the tail outs and I really focus on the big, deep holes. And and see, you can go down in a drift boat, and and I will like I picked out a picked up a pretty good brown, oh, with my dad a few days ago, and he was kind of hanging in a in a seam spot where he was hanging in slow wintertime water water, but more of like a seam than a than a big wintertime hole, and so you will catch him in those spots. But going down in a boat, it's amazing how many fishy spots I stick my bugs and don't get eats. But then you get to one of these big slow wintertime tailouts and toss it in there, and they seem to be stacked in there. And now these browns, they spawn through these winter months, and, um, you know, and I don't like to target uh, reds, which are, like, um, where, they, um, where they're doing their spawning, where they're guarding reds, or where they're doing any of this, but they tend to they tend to be, like, November, December, I would say, and I actually haven't seen many reds out. I've seen a couple of them. And, um, but, but I like to, I like to fish for these, um, these fish when they're sitting in big holes and things of that nature. And I'm always careful in these wintertime months that I'm not stepping on reds. Uh, so as we're wade fishing, we want to make sure to not step in these rubbed rocks or anything like that. And these rubbed rocks can also tell us a lot about the fish. These reds will tell us, you know, where these fish like to spawn at. And usually, you know, they're not too far away in a big, deep wintertime hole is where they'll hold at or or where they'll be. And now I think we're through the the brown spawn. I haven't seen any sign for quite a while. Um, but yeah, these, these fish, man, they're still hungry. And so... You know, streamer fishing is definitely more effective with warmer water when they're chasing. But you guys know this streamer kick I've been on lately that I just absolutely love throwing these things. And the deal with streamers is is it just hunts for big fish, big predatory fish, like the biggest fish in the river. And, you know, there's different theories on what they think, you know, a streamer is. And, And a lot of them... You know, I tend to do the best, like in the Madison, you know, there's a lot of sculpin patterns. And I really think these things are eaten uh, uh, sculpin. You know, it's just a big meal and it's almost instinctual. You know, a fish comes swimming by that they can eat that's a big meal in the wintertime and they just tend to eat it. And so these streamers, they're not chasing as hard. But the deal is, is if you get it by the right fish, he will eat it. And I've, I've proven it, you know, this winter time and time again. Um, but I, uh, the, they'll, they'll eat these, these flies. They tend to want to eat it slower. So I'm not getting them on the strip as much as I'm getting them on the swing. And a swing is a, you know, it's a, it's a steelhead tactic to swing these big sculpins and, you know, they'll eat, I think they're eating sculpin. I think they're eating a lot of leeches as well. And so I think sometimes they'll eat a streamer for a leech and then also bait fish patterns, and then it just taps into that that instinctual, you know, uh, a chase. Like that that bug comes by their face, they can hardly resist it, especially if it looks right. So a lot of the patterns I'm using for these streamers, um, I really like. Uh, like Kelly Gallup, I want to get him on the podcast, and I will. He's not too far away from me here, and I've reached out and touched bases with him. But that guy has some awesome streamer patterns. Uh, so I love using a lot of his streamer patterns. Um, you know, he's got, gosh, she's got the funniest names for him. I think the one he calls the sex dungeon or something like that. But it's, uh, uh, God, what a great fly. He ties it in black and green. And I actually, he ties a mini as well. And that mini I've done really good on, like the mini black. Um, but I really like, like, the, like the, the, the bigger green size. It's got green and gold into it. It looks like a sculpin, and um, it's got a deer hair head to it, like a green deer hair head. And, um, man, I mean, what a fly. So I like using, you know, greens, whites, blacks. Um, you know, a lot of guys do good off yellows. I, I need to fish yellows more, and I have got some action on yellow because uh, I think it imitates a brown trout, that yellow flash. 
Um, but in these winter months, it's just like my go-to, and you don't catch a lot of fish. It It's like um, I show up at a hole, and it's like I'm always going to swing through it first. And when I swing through it, I'm casting, quartering downstream, holding my line and letting it swing through the water there. And as it gets into the... Uh, into the still water or it gets really slow it'll start to hang up and that's when I'll start to strip and then after I make a cast I take a step down and make another cast step down and repeat and cover that hole swinging through it uh, it's amazing these wintertime fish are just grabbing that thing and and I'm getting quite a few of them and they're just those big older age class predatory fish and so uh, I've really enjoyed swinging these holes and um, I, I love I love um you know, fishing these streamers throughout spring and into summer and things of that nature. Um, so I have been doing that quite a bit. And, um, you know, gosh, it's it's like, um, you know, my best day this winter is like probably like, um, like, like getting three or four fish or something like that off a streamer to eat. That's a pretty good day. But I did talk to my buddy Dylan Ness, who I've had on the podcast a couple times, and he sent me these photos. And he fishes um, a bunch of rivers out east. Uh, I know he fishes the Yellowstone quite a bit. I'm not sure if this is where he's at or not. He didn't tell me the stream, and I don't want to blow up his spot, but he loves wintertime fishing. So you see Dylan Ness with all these giant pictures of these giant trout. He does a lot of his work in the wintertime, a lot of his fishing work, that is. So um, the other day, <coughs> excuse me. The other day, he sent me a photo. Did he say... I, I think he said he... I think he said he, like... Oh, gosh. I should probably look at the text so I don't get it wrong. It was either 7 or it was 12 to the net and and all off the swinger. And he was using that big dungeon. Um, I don't, you know, he's got some good bugs that he swings with that, um, he set me up with too. Such a nice guy. Like he comes out here and he'll always bring me a couple ties and he'll go, Hey, check this out. These rainbows really like this thing. And he swung up a heck of a good rainbow. Uh, but he's doing the same tactic where he's swinging these big wintertime holes and he's getting these fish, but he got some action just two days ago. Let me find it here. I gotta, sh I gotta tell, I gotta get this right. Cause, um, he got them so good. Um, let's see if I can outsmart my smartphone here. Okay, here it is. Oh, no. So I got to look back at these. Um... Oh, gosh. Okay, here we go. Oh, that's uh, He caught a fish that was tagged, a really nice brown the other day that was really cool. Um, looking at this stream he's fishing, it just looks so money. But he's using these same wintertime tactics, and he uses this all over, different streams in Wyoming, in Montana, and um, just absolutely gets him. But, oh, there it is. Gosh, he got a couple nice brown trout. And then one stud rainbow. What is, um, 12 to the net. Seven over 20 inches. Good lordy. Absolute in shock. That was his text to me. It sent me a few photos. Uh, just some, some hog brown trout. Um, so so he had, you know, here I talk about, you know, catching three is a good day or hooking three is a good day. Um, and, and I'll swing these runs and see what I'm doing is I'm bringing my streamer rod and then I'm bringing, uh, uh, also bring in my, my nymph rod with me. In my swinging rod, a lot of times, like in these winter months, I'm bringing my six-weight spay rod. I could just reach so far out. And then you have to find the right weighted line. So the right weighted line gets it down to the right depth. And and this is, a, um, this is where it took me a while to dial in my process on this swing fishing because you got to get those bugs down where they're swinging down in front of those fish's face. And so um, I, I've tried some different setups. It seems like in this... In the Madison, it seems like a T11, um, which is a, a weighted line. Uh, that T11, about a 10 foot, is about right. Uh, it seems like when I go to T14, which is what I have on there now, I can get some bigger, deeper holes. 
uh, like a 10 foot section of T14 or something like that. And I might even go to like an eight foot section of T14. Seems to be fishing pretty good for me, but I really like that T11. 10 foot leader seems to be about right for this river. Now, different rivers are going to be different depths. Um, you know, so you can, you can definitely go heavier or lighter and, and what you're doing, it's like most fishing where you're just, um, you're monitoring how it's fishing and for a swing fish, you want it a uh, swing hole. You want it about, um, walking pace as far as going down the river, somewhere two to four feet. And, um, then as you throw it out and you swing it across, you know, it should swing and not really bump too much down and through there. And then at the end of your swing, it'll start bumping a couple rocks and things. And so it's just a feel for it. It's just doing it for a while and getting a feel for it. And then especially after you get fish is a good thing. And I, um, gosh, I got my dad for Christmas. I bought him a, a package of like my favorite streamers that I have. You know, some of those things are seven, eight bucks a piece. And so uh, he didn't have a real good selection of streamers. And um, so he, so he's uh I, I he's got a streamer rod and then he's got his nymph rod and so i got him a bunch of streamers for christmas and we went out yesterday or day before day before yesterday got a nice warm day out there and so we got to a big winter time a hole and i said well why don't you swing through it i'll follow you and you know then we can we can nymph it and then move on to the next one and so he swung through it and uh, right down at the end at the tail out sure enough he swung up a really nice uh brown down at the end of that thing um, so that was really cool to get him a, a good fish on the swing that fought really hard. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's been fun swinging these different bugs through there. And so I'll make a pass through a hole or I'll make two passes, three passes with, you know, I'll change the color of my bug, go from a, that green's been hot for me lately, but I do like the white. I like the black. And then, um, gosh, I've got some new patterns. I'll be fishing more like, um, some tans and then, um, some more yellows in a pattern that I really like. Uh, gosh, I got this yellow. I think I got it in a dungeon, but there's, um, yeah, there's the bigger dungeons, the smaller dungeons. Uh, there's the, um, gosh, I'm, I'm absolutely drawing a blank right now. Uh, my favorite, the, the boogeyman is a good pattern, um, like that one, the Silk Kitty. Gosh, I love that Silk Kitty in white and green. Uh, barely legal. Uh, it's like this, um, It's you know, and, and really, you know, I'm looking for life and movement of this fly as it moves through the water. But that um, barely legal and green and white is a good color. It represents a sculpin. And then I like the gray and white, too. The gray and white is like a bait fish. And uh, they seem to eat that one pretty well, too. So I like those. Oh, I like that. That peanut envy and green is a really good one. And, and it just takes like like buying these different streamers and just trying them out. And then, you know, once you kind of catch some fish on them, you start to build some confidence in them. And then, um, you know, they become a go to. And so uh, been swinging these holes and and um, the, the knowledge of the river really helps is knowing where these bigger wintertime holes are. But you can still be doing it while exploring you know wade fishing is really good this time of year i like wading down to big holes and fishing and and uh things of that nature and then you know the the nymphing is probably the most effective tactic this time of year and and you guys have heard me on the podcast like i love technical nymphing and if you can learn how to nymph well you can catch fish anywhere north america anywhere in the world like um you know, it's not such a specialized tactic as uh, streamer fishing or dry fly fishing. Like, like nymphing is universal, and it it transposes and transfers to different waters, and it's just it is like the most effective way to fish. It just gets your bugs down to those fish, gives them a chance to eat it. But they there's an art to it. You can't just put on the right bugs or put on some bugs, throw on an indicator, and throw it out there and think you're going to catch fish. And and in these boat fishing, a lot of times you know, the rower is doing a lot of the work of, of keeping the boat right by the indicator, you know, to catch these fish. But when you're out wade fishing or you're from the bank, you know, you've got to get these drag-free drifts. And, and that's what those fish like to eat is the drag-free drifts. And th they like to eat it because it doesn't move. It looks natural. They also like to eat it because a drag-free drift sinks to the bottom. And the key with nymphing is to really dive into it and learn about the effectiveness of it. And so, you know, I love fishing an indicator. That's my preferred method. It just seems like I can I can cover so much water. And so when I'm nymph fishing, 
you know, the key with nymphing, you know, like other fishing, is just understanding it, too. It's like getting your bugs down to the bottom where they're going to be most effective. And so you can do that through adjusting your leader length or adjusting your weight. And usually what I run, you know, in the... The, um, the Madison isn't a very deep river, but I like to be able to get down in these big, deep wintertime holes. And so, you know, this time of year, I'm running like six foot to my to my first bug or five foot to my weight. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll do like five foot of a heavier test or six foot of a heavier test. And then, you know, like I'll, I'll tie that with like 15 pound and then maybe 12 pound and then when I get down to where I'm going to put my weight I'll tie a blood knot and then I'll tie 16 inches of a lesser weight that way if it ever breaks it breaks that lesser weight and you still have your leader length and your weight so um, anywhere I'd say four to six foot to your weight and that can be adjusted but four to six foot to your weight uh, I'm just going minimal weight like a BB couple BBs 12 to 16 inches to my first fly and then 12 to 16 inches to my second fly. Um, I'll tie it off the back of the hook or tie it off the eye of the hook to my second fly. And um, what you're doing, it's the same as that, you know, what I was talking about streamer fishing is just getting a feel for the drift and how it's working its way through the water. And so I'll throw up stream and I'm really watching my indicator and, and I'm watching it. You don't want it grinding on the bottom. Uh, you want it to be like pretty much drifting through and bump bottom a couple times. And so then, you know, the biggest thing with nymphing is just adjusting your weight so you're getting a really good drift through the hole. So again, adjust it. You can slide, you know, your indicator. You can slide it up or down the line to shorten or lengthen your leader length. To lengthen it makes it go deeper. And I like... I like a longer leader with less weight. I seem to get a good wash in the water. Um, but yeah, going like four to six feet to my weight, 12 to 16 inches to the first fly, 12 to 16 inches to the back fly, and then just adjust it according to how it's fishing. And when I'm nymph fishing, like I want to cover a lot of water. And so it, it's not trying to cast out as far as you can cast out. Like a lot of times these wintertime fish are really close. And so I'm running close drifts, I'm running medium drifts, I'm running far drifts. And in wintertime, these fish aren't moving a long ways for the bugs. And so you got to get it right by them. So a lot of times you'll fish a hole for 15, 20 minutes, not get anything, and then all of a sudden you'll find a fish out there. Um, so it's it's fishing these big wintertime holes, knowing where there's fish, and then being effective with your drift. And so I cast upstream. And then I'll usually, I'll strip as my indicator comes down, not pulling it, but I'm basically pulling up the slack. And as it gets close to me, then I throw a big mend into it, and I try to get my line above that indicator. And now, you know, where this technique really comes in good, like, um, is being able to fish way down below you uh, with a good, true dead drift. And so stacking that line above that indicator and letting it go down below you, and you can fish... 100 feet down below you, 150 feet down below you, and then you just get a really good, uh, I like to 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 set the hook up and back and behind me hard, you know, if a fish eats it. And so basically you're monitoring your indicator. And as your indicator goes down and it bumps bottom, you'll see it tick. And, and these trout can be a subtle eat. Sometimes it isn't much. Um, but when that indicator goes down, you have to believe in it and set like it's a fish every time. And and half the time, it is bottom or it is nothing. But if you don't set the hook like that every time, when it is a fish, you'll miss them. And so uh, set the hook hard every time and then really get good at stacking that line above that indicator and really feeding it way down below you. And if it gets too far down below you where you can't set the hook and get to that line, most of the time I can get to it every time. Uh, there's also like a an extended loop drift uh, where you actually use the loop of the line and set upstream and use the water tension to set that hook. And that'll work way down below you as well. Um, but I just get good at covering water. And, and really nymphing, you know, I, I've got 12, 15 bugs I really like. And then, you know, I'll try working some other bugs in there that I'll, that I'll use and things. But I've kind of got my go-to that I know fish like to eat. And then it's just about working the holes. I'm not changing my bugs a whole lot. 
Uh, I'm just making drifts, and I'm really working different lines. I'm working, you know, like I say, close, medium, far, and then really working on getting that that um, drift go way down below me down there uh, to try to hunt out any fish that are sitting down in that tail out down in there. And, and um, nymphing is just so effective. Usually when I'm nymphing, you know, if there's a, a stone flies present, um, like we've got a lot of salmon flies in our river, it's just a good meal for these trout. And so I love using rubber legs. And, and just like sculpin hunts for big fish, big rubber legs, big nymphs, they hunt for big fish. And, you know, actually like dad swung up that brown the other day. I swung through it after him with a different color. We swung the hole, and then we thought, well, we'll we'll nymph the hole, go down through. And actually, the two I caught off nymphs, I caught them both off my rubber legs. One great big rainbow that was over 20, and then um, a great big long brown, kind of long and skinny. But both of those fish were nicer than the fish we caught with the streamer and caught them both with the rubber legs. So the same way that streamer hunts for big fish, so does the rubber leg. And, and when I say rubber leg, that's kind of like a universal turn as they tie rubber legs onto like a size 8, size 6, something of that nature, stonefly imitation. Now, I say rubber leg, but I've actually grown to love like these, um, they're a, a yarn legged or they're a, a, like a floss legged. I guess that would be the right way to describe it. So getting away from the rubber leg and using like this floss or like this this heavy duty floss that's different colors like a yellow or a brown and and they're tied in the same way a rubber leg's tied but those legs just have a really good wash and action in the water and these fish just love it so lately i've been hooked you know and i have a bunch of different rubber leg patterns and a bunch of different sizes but usually my go to is like a dark brown with dark brown legs they just seem to really like that i'll, I'll also use a lighter colored one with yellow legs works good and, and then the old standby black with black legs is one of my favorite black with black rubber legs and then um uh, i'll also use a black with white legs as well um but uh, but i'll use you know i've got different patterns you know they're not too complicated or intricate or anything of that nature i mean they're they're um you know they're they're just um basically some some uh what's that stuff called famille or Vermeer or but basically that the the dubbing for the body and then um you know two legs out the front two legs out the back and four legs coming out um of the sides you know two out of each side and uh, it's a it's a really simple bug and a simple tie, which I like. Uh, easy for me to tie, easy for me to put on. I usually, you know, I I have some that are weighted in my bag and some that aren't. If I go with a weighted one, I won't use any weight and I'll kind of shorten my leader. So I'll go five to six foot to the rubber leg and then go off my trailer fly there. Um, trailer flies. So uh, that's lead flies. Uh, I love a rubber leg. Hunts for big fish. I also have some leeches that I really like that fish really good for me. I've got one that I tie up with like a um, this maroon red and black tail. And then it's kind of got... Um, Oh, I'm, I'm trying to remember, you know, half of the flies I tie are just the stuff that I have out of my box, but I use this dubbing. Um, it, it's a Kaufman stone dubbing, and it's got all these different colors to it, and I tie a leech out of it. And and they also tie some stone flies out of that dubbing as well. It's just a real fishy dubbing. Uh, but I tie this leech, and so it's like this multicolored leech, and it's got this maroon and black tail and I, I like using small leeches too I'll use like a size 12 bead head leech uh, and then also go to some bigger ones as well uh, but I love leading with a bigger fly because I just think they hunt for fish so I'll use smaller sculpin patterns I'll use leeches I'll use rubber legs and I try to go something big up front um, you know, if I'm trying to fish small or if it doesn't seem like the fish are eating big, then I'll go with a, with a prince nymph up front size 12, or like I tie a really good pheasant tail that I'll run up front. Um, and, and a, a handful of other patterns, but basically I get these patterns that fish like to eat and that I have confidence in. And then those are my patterns that I fish so I can fish them with confidence. So I'm not fishing the whole time thinking, gosh, will a fish really eat this thing? Or I'm not even sure if they like this thing this time of year. Instead, I just know, um, trailer flies. 
man, I, I like to use a bigger hook because I like to get a big bite if I do catch a good fish. Um, I, you know, San Juan worms are just a go-to anywhere. Uh, they're such a simple fly. They're like a one-step fly. It tie, uh, tie some chenille to the, to the hook and, and, um, you're set to go. So, um, I do like like a pink worm, hot pink worm, uh, small one. And then, uh, you know, all the red, tans, oranges. I, I fish a lot of San Juans. It just, it's just this great pattern that's like forgotten about, you know, dang near. Um, so fish always like to eat those things. Um, sometimes I'll trail with a smaller pheasant tail, uh, lately, and you'll hear this in an upcoming podcast. So I got this from Euro nymphing. A lot of the nymphs they're using are weighted really well. These smaller nymphs, um, and, and they use a bead head on them, and so they're made for Euro nymphing. But I've been using these flies as a trailer fly, uh, and they work dang good. And in any of this stuff, uh, brassies, uh, uh, gosh, this time of year, like uh, if I can go, you know. I'm not a huge fan of midge fishing, but the fish like to eat them in the wintertime. And so, you know, I can't help but fish them. And sometimes they're just so action that I can't help but fish them. So I like a, a disco midge, and I try to go with the biggest size I can, like a 16. But I like a, a disco midge. I like, um, um, gosh, I've got some midges that I tie up. I've got this one uh, with an Antron kind of head on it. Um, that's kind of like an emerging midge um, that works really good for me. So I'll use that thing and um, serendipities. Uh, they're kind of like a they can imitate midge or imitate caddis. And so like I can usually fish up a size on those things, a 16 or 14. Uh, green is usually my color. I don't do as good on red on that thing. Um, but tons of different. Uh, nymphs out there and the shops are really good at advising you you know what nymphs fish are eating on in that system and so you know I'm pretty dialed on my process on the Madison and so you know I'll use those as is um smaller fly as a trailer fly and um bigger fly as my lead fly and, and then as I'm nymphing along like it's just so effective and it's it's an art like anything you go with somebody that's really good at nymphing they will catch a lot of fish off nymphs where you know Somebody that's less experienced won't catch as many. So, I mean, it's just crazy. Like, I go out, you know, I went out with that day the other, uh, I went out the other day with my dad. And, and I've been going out quite a bit lately, um, uh, drifts and wade fishing and things. And I go out a lot by myself as well. But, yeah, I got my dad out. He swung up that one fish. That was the only one we swung up. But using nymphs, you know, I was able to hook another five, six trout, something like that with nymphs. Um, it's just so effective at, at hunting for those fish. So, you know, you catch five, six fish, and, it, and it's wintertime months, and they're they really feeding at the warmest part of the day. And so, gosh, that that three to five seems to be a good time, or two to four seems to be a good time. So you've I've only got a couple-hour window to catch these fish, but gosh, to go out, hook five, six fish, and they're all over 18 inches, all like really nice fish, like that's a good day of fishing. Uh, nobody on the river, great view of the mountains, no wind. Um, man, it's just so fun to get out and, and to hunt for these things. And so, um, you know, those are kind of my tactics that, that I'm using. And then, you know, I'm using my Onyx as well. Uh, just walking myself down the river, trying to think of where these good wintertime holes are that I can walk to or that I can float down to. Um, you know, I, I like having my drift boat out this time of year. I I actually got rid of my single man craft. It was a hand me down. I'd had it for ten years, and um, the the webbing was starting to to bust off from the pontoons to the frame, and so I had to get rid of it. But I'm gonna get another one of these single man crafts just for me and and um, you know going by myself. They're so handy, and also for like exploring these other rivers. Like I've I've got. I've got this little dirt bike that I use for um, use for hunting, for getting around on these things. But I've got a dirt bike carrier on the back of my truck that I can just pull it up on there and have it there. And then with that single man craft, have that single man craft in there. And pretty much I can drive and drop my dirt bike at the takeout and, um, you know, go up to the put in and then drift down in this single man craft and cover these rivers by myself. And so... Um, you know, I've got to get another little single man craft before spring so I can start to explore more of these places. But man, it's just a great time to be out. Like I say, just have it 
absolutely all to myself. And, um, you know, these, these bigger fish, uh, that they're, they're just in the river and they're hungry and they're looking for food. And so it's just been a riot getting out. And so I've been getting ready. I got to make a trip over to steelhead land over the, to the, um, Olympic Peninsula and do some fishing. And they did some, some major rule changes this year over there. So, um, no more fishing from a boat over there on those systems. And, you know, they're just trying to lessen the impact on these steelhead so that they can, they can, um, survive you know the steelhead runs are in tough shape over there but um the good thing is is um keeping it open for sports fishing and um being able to continue to fish because once they shut it down they'll shut everything down for for years and we've seen it on on different rivers over there uh that they've had to shut down and and you know the 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 um you know, the fishermen are one issue, you know, there's also, uh, you know, the tribes at the bottom get to gill net, you know, for half the runs down there. And, and, and then also, you know, the, the fishing out in the oceans. And so, you know, these steelhead ha- have so many things that are working against them, but now can't keep any fish, which is really good. I haven't kept a steelhead since, gosh, since I was a kid, you know, it seems like I turn everyone back, but you know, there also needs to be really good handling practices. Um, you know, I know in Washington, you have to keep the fish wet, can't pull them out of the water, uh, which is a good thing. Um, also, you know, you're using, um, good rubber nets and, you know, all these fish practices, you know, we can put into place on all these rivers is, you know, we don't want accidental kill on these fish. And, um, so they have rules in place this year out there in Washington where you can't fish from a boat anymore. So um, no more of that technical nymphing from a boat. It's going to have to be wade fishing, um, you know, one single barbless hook. Uh, can't keep any of the fish. And so they're just passing rules. So, you know, hopefully that that um, we can make a, a positive positive impact on these fish and, and uh, hopefully have them for years to come for, for not only me and for you, but for future generations. And so... Um, Glad to see uh, uh, Washington was able to, to keep the season open but still help protect those fish a little bit more. And and um, so I'm excited to get out there and do a little fishing and um, do some trips here this spring. But, gosh, every day that's above freezing that I have the chance to uh, try to get out on these these local rivers. And then I just love coming into springtime. They'll, they'll start getting on this um, on the streamers more. Uh, just being more active, more daylight hours that I can fish, warmer weather, so uh, that'll be fun as well. But, um, man, for for wintertime, targeting these bigger fish, uh, I've caught a bunch of big ones here so far this winter, and nothing huge and next level yet, uh, but but I, uh, I think it's coming. You know, it's just putting in these days and working these big holes, and um, yeah, I've caught you know, a bunch of fish over 20 inches and just looking to break that, that next level of 24 inches or whatever. And it'll happen. But targeting these bigger fish in the wintertime is, is so fun and a great pastime. And especially a warmer weather winter like we've had thus far has just been an absolute riot. So, um, yeah, I've been doing that. I'll be doing a lot more of it here in the future, but I just wanted to get on and kind of share some of these, these tactics that are working for me in the winter time, kind of the the uh, the water that I'm targeting, uh, the tactics that I'm using, uh, and so yeah, I'll, I'll be out uh, using that. Gosh, uh, that that spay rod is so good for swinging in the winter time. You can just cast so far, and then it's got such a good swing to it. Uh, so using that thing a bunch, which has been really fun and. And uh, so, yeah, hopefully be able to get a chance to get out this week. I haven't looked at the weather forecast yet, uh, but hoping I get maybe an afternoon this week where I can get out and and um, go get after it. Man, you got to be careful wintertime waiting. Jesus, it slick out. And and the felt gives me um, such good grip on the river, um, you know, and, and you have to be careful with felt that you're, that you're not... Uh, fishing different waters and, and, uh, moving, uh, invasive aquatic species, but God, the felt just grips so good on, on the mossy rocks, but the felt also sticks to the snow and starts building up. So you're walking on these ice skates or walking on built up snow. And so I have to kick my feet every couple times, but then I wear my rubber and then the, you know, my rubber boots, they, they track really good in the snow and things, but then getting in the river, those things are just slick as all get out. I do have some felt with some spikes that I've been using. I, I want to try these 
the bar boots. I've heard my buddies talk about them. I, I think I think Patagonia makes them, but these metal bars that go across the boot uh, that really give a lot of grip and they're not felt. And uh, so that would be pretty cool to try out those things and um, see how those things work. It does get a little sketchy in the wintertime. I have this big hole that I like to go to. And I've got to cross the river and then walk down. And it's not too bad in the spring or so. I don't really think about it too much. But boy, I, I got out there, you know, and you've got to pick the right place to cross. And um, it's kind of tough to read, you know. You kind of just head across and then you, you kind of find out where you're crossing once you get out in the middle. And it's so slick, these big bowling balls that are just covered with moss rock out there. And then um, it's it's got to be mid-thigh or upper thigh out there in the deepest part I mean, it gets a little bit sketch in the wintertime. If you go down, if I go down, I'm going to have to race back to my truck. But, you know, I've also got pretty sure-footed over the years. I can wade and you just kind of keep your your feet moving. It's been a long time since I've taken a swim. So, um, uh, But the other day I was definitely thinking about it, making that sketchy cross as there was some slush ice coming down. And um, I kind of crossed in a deeper section, so it got like waist high. I had to keep my feet moving. So a guy definitely has to be careful in these wintertime months. You don't want to go down in that river, but um, it's just been a riot. Uh, so fortunate to be able to live, you know, by these streams and be able to take advantage of them on a, when I get in a good afternoon or when I get a free day or a free weekend day, uh, like this last Saturday was really good. So uh, it's been really fun, been fishing hard and, and uh, back to it. So just wanted to share with you guys um, – how it's been going. Gosh, these fish have a ton of fight right now, too. This this cold water, um, man, they are just happy. Um, you know, I know they get fighting harder as the water temperature warms up a little bit, but, man, they've, they've been giving me plenty of fight out there. So, yeah, just been having fun and um, having fun doing this podcast. So I sure appreciate your guys' support. I've got some good recordings coming up to help prepare you guys for fishing season and uh, get ready to go get after them and go do some exploring. So many great rivers to explore in all of our western states. And um, I definitely need to take more time and be better at exploring a lot of these different systems as I, I get stuck in a rut in my, my local spots here in Montana, you know, within a couple hours, there's 10 different rivers I can fish. And so I get a little spoiled, but I definitely want to travel a little bit more and, um, get and take advantage of some of these other States. I've got to get down to Wyoming just has such great fly fishing down there. Uh, so I've got to do more of that. Um, Idaho, Utah, Colorado. I mean, there's just so many great places to, to go fish. So I've got to do more of that. But right now on the horizon is the Olympic Peninsula and making that trip happen and, and uh, go try to get after some of these steelhead and fish in some of these local rivers. And then in the spring, I'll, I'll get to venture out a little bit more. But All right, guys, that's a wrap. Eastman's Flycast, again, really appreciate your support. And uh, if you're in the market for anything, make sure to check out Avid Max. And um, yeah, check in with you guys next week.